All right, we are officially live. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to a new episode of Lunch on the Bates. I am your co-host, Debo, along with my other co-host, Owen. Finally back yeah, after a few episode hiatus. Let's get chaotic it. winter break, what can I say? Yeah, for Been sure, busy, for man. sure. Yeah, uh, you want to tell the audience what you did over break, Owen? Oh, man, I went on a cruise, dude. It was a lot of fun. A little Caribbean seven-day cruise. It was a blast. Brother went crazy, man. Sure and, did, um, man. Happy for the brother, man. You know, uh, that's probably up up on the majority of people's bucket list. You know, going on a cruise one day, chilling out for a week, you know, feel the vibe to the scenery, you know, the, the exotic lifestyle, all that good stuff. So, hey, man. Yeah, man. If you haven't done it, I couldn't recommend it more. Mm. Yeah, that's on that's on my bucket list. So hopefully mm-hmm. I can achieve that in like the near future. You know, once yes, I start getting this money up, or maybe it could be even a family event. Uh, I, oh yeah, bro. Fine. Either one's fine by me. So yeah, cruise is cruise. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> we'll get into it. Um, shoot, back to virtual recording for this episode. Um, obviously we did that with well, with the last episode with me and Matt on board. We were uh, in person, but with this week, due to schedule constraints, cons- constraints, constraints, excuse me, um, at the recording studio we work at, and also with um, Matt's brother's birthday it's being today. Happy birthday to Matt's brother. Happy birthday, um, Ari. What's up? Salute to Ari. Shout out, shout out to Ari. I think he turns 25. I'm not sure. I got I something to about that. There. Yeah. yeah, somewhere around 25. So happy birthday to, to Ari Kishinevsky, Matt's brother. Um, but, you know, which leads to Matt obviously not being here with us for today's episode, uh, recording with us. But, hey, man, uh, we hope he can come back for next week's episode, recording with us. And for tonight, he can chill out for a minute and just cool out with his family. On a Have Thursday. some good food, you know. Yeah, good food as well. Yo, yo, <laughs> we, I was low key baking him for, for like yesterday when I heard that. Oh, I saw that you're like, you're like dinner on a Thursday. <laughs> yeah, and like I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to be an asshole about it, but I was just confused. Like it would just be the most optimal time to do it, like on a weekend, preferably Saturday, even even on a Friday night. You know, when everybody's like off work and people yeah. are the least busy in their week. But hey, man. All up to Matt and, and his brother in the Kishinevsky family. You know, he wished them good health and peace and prosperity. So, hey, we're going we to keep it moving. That's right. That's we're right. going to keep it moving. <clears throat> right. So, with today's agenda, uh, we are going to go into uh, last week's NFL wildcard games. We are going to do like a little segment, our main segment for that, uh, what we learned over the wild card weekend, we're going to each have three statements and then to say what we are, our thoughts basically from the past games. And along with that, we're going to talk a little bit of NBA, obviously with the recent news, Pascal Siaka heading to the Indiana Pacers in a three-team deal. <sighs> Crazy stuff going on over there as well. So it's going to be a fun one as usual. Let's, so Yeah, let's get into it, man. Yeah, shoot. We're coming in fire. We're going to come in hot. Yeah. And speaking on Pascal Siakam, let's get into this trade. We're going to have a little reaction for the Siakam trade. <clears throat> yeah, no, I don't know. That's a It's an interesting trade for me for sure. Because mm-hmm. it's like, it's honestly a trade where it's like, it's a obviously a big star player getting traded. Mm-hmm. But I don't think it makes Indiana all that much better than they were before. And for the Raptors, I just think it kind of keeps them right where they're at, to be honest. But that's my initial reaction. Obviously, oh. there's a chance I'm going to get proven wrong, but I'd like to hear your reaction too, Debo. Okay. First off, before I say my reaction, here's a quick rundown of the trade details. The Pacers received Pascal Siakam and a 2024 second-round pick from the Pistons. The Raptors received Bruce Brown, Jordan Nwora, Kira Lewis Jr. from the uh, Pelicans, uh, as well as a 2024 first-round pick from the Pacers, a 24 first-round pick, lesser of picks from the Utah Jazz, LA Clippers, 
Houston Rockets and OKC Thunder, uh, as well as a 26 first round pick from the Pacers, protected from one to four. And the Pelicans, they just received money uh, in the deal. So nothing too um, Man, you, you got to catch your breath after all that. Yeah, I sure do. Man. <laughs> but, but I'm going to keep it rolling. <clears throat> and with my thought about this trade, it's pretty much a win-win deal. Uh, I'll start off with Indiana. Um, obviously, the main goal with the Pacers right now is to make their franchise player, Tyrese Halliburton, ha- happy as Halliburton – uh, as the season progressed, he has stated, especially during their in-season tournament run, that he is tired of being a loser and he wants to win. And so with the Pacers front office, with this move, they bring a proven shot creator alongside Halliburton, as well as a true number two option, um, being a good a good, good on the wing as well. And with Siakam, he's a great fit to this Pacers team uh, with Indiana having the scheme of being an up and down, high tempo offense. Uh, love to get crazy in the transition game. And Siakam is a great guy for that. He, he's a great in transition as well as cutting to the basket and getting uh, easy shots around the rim. So for the Pacers, I feel like that's good on their behalf. Despite Siakam's expiring contract uh, over the summer, he is on an expiring deal. So who knows if he resigns with Indiana or not. But I just feel like well, for what the trade was, it's a good move for Indiana for them being like a win now team, uh, being competitive in the Eastern Conference. Um, for Toronto, for Toronto, for Toronto, um, Masai Ujiri, you know, I've had a lot of smoke from Masai Ujiri, Raptors GM, <laughs> over the past few months when we've talked about the Raptors. Uh, the, the way he's been treating this, uh, well, post title run. Uh, with Van Vliet and Ananobi and uh, Siakam before they all left. I feel like with uh, keeping those three guys on the team for as long as he did, um, squeezing as little amount of value as they had if, well, I phrased that poorly, but (laughs) keeping those guys for as long as they did, you know, without trading them at their highest value. Uh, Van Vliet, obviously, he he left in free agency to the Rockets this past offseason on a Nobi. They they got R.J. Barrett and Emmanuel quickly, but at the same time, they didn't get any high assets when it comes to draft picks. And Siakam, um, they, they only got three first, well, yeah, they, they only got they only got three first, uh, which with the Pacers, th- th- those are two of them. And the Pacers, uh, as of right now, with their team and how they're constructed, they're going to be a good team for a very long time. So it's probably going to be in the mid to late first round. And the other first round pick, those four teams I mentioned before, they're going to be competing for a long time as well. So I, I just feel like if Siakam was treated sooner uh, in this scenario, probably for a much higher cap draft capital 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 higher draft capital cap wow a much higher draft oh, capital stutter. yeah my fault draft Nothing capital major. excuse me draft capital cap capital dang i can't say anything <laughs> bro, I was free- <laughs> no, bro, <laughs> bro, <laughs> i'm gonna say this once to defend myself i was out in the freezing cold i'm uh, trying to get to my car it was like a, an 11 minute walk uh, like walk there, uh, and I was just freezing my ass off, man, the whole time. Ooh, and my, my butt was freezing, but I couldn't feel my fingers. So I think with that past stutter, I think I'm feeling a little bit of the of the chills still in my body. <laughs> but we're gonna keep it moving. We're gonna keep it strong. But um, on to the Raptors. Um, yeah, the the way Miss Ayujiri has handled this rebuild wasn't the best but at the same time getting as much value as you possibly can with Siakam's expiring deal was a solid move and also with the Ananobi trade getting two young assets in RJ Barrett and Emmanuel quickly see what those guys are uh can they be reliable pieces for your team to contend in the playoffs in the near future I felt like for what it was, it was a good move on his behalf. And also taking a flyer on Kira Lewis, a uh, young point guard, who knows if he can still um, be a reliable player in the NBA. Yeah, for sure. Um, I do think it was a smart move by Masai Jerry to hold him for this long and then finally decide to get rid of him because 
if they would have stayed together, I mean, it's very evident that Pascal was not very happy in Toronto. So that choice to get rid of him and, and avoid any locker room off the court uh, conflict, yeah, I think it's a very mm-hmm. smart uh, move, especially in the middle of a rebuild when the I guess your hopes aren't as high as they would be if you're having a crazy winning season. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, now with this Raptors team, they have some exciting exciting pieces to build around. Barrett, Quickly, who I mentioned, um, Grady Dick. Uh, I, I was a fan of Grady Dick, obviously. Hey, Shout out yeah. KU, go KU. Hopefully he can bounce back from his very slow start in his rookie year. We'll see how he can develop uh, with this Raptors team. And especially now with Scotty Barnes, uh, he's stepping out in his breakout role, uh, looking to be a more uh, defined player offensively while having defensive upside, looking like a potential franchise player uh, that this team can build around. So sure. this Raptors team right now, they they could be very exciting in the near future, depending on how this free agency period and the drafts in the next two to three years go for them. Yeah, for sure. I- I just, I definitely do think the Raptors are in a crazy interesting spot within the league because they're nowhere near the worst team, <clears throat> Detroit, sorry, uh, but they're also at way far from being a solid winning playoff contending team. And I feel like it's been that way since uh, since Kawhi brought them a championship after this or the season following that. And I feel like it's going to stay that way for the next three, four or five years. Yeah, for sure. And I want to go back to Indiana before we wrap this segment up. For sure. With this Pacers team, with Siakam, what, what is their ceiling as of right now? We're talking like how far they could go in the playoffs? Yeah, yeah, depending, uh, for this year. I think they could shock some people and find their way in a conference uh, title game or a conference oh, title ooh. series. Series, yes, series. Yeah. And the Pacers, they've been like a breakout team so far, and we're just over the midway point of the season. They still have got a lot to figure out. Now they have a player, uh, a nice number two player to complement Tyrese Halliburton's uh, offensive mastermind game. It'll be interesting to see. All right. Now, now, now you, right. Now you said that, and I'm looking at the top teams in the Eastern Conference right now. Out of Boston, Milwaukee, Philly, and Cleveland, those are the top four teams right now. Yeah. Which teams can you see uh, Indiana beat in a playoff series? I could see them beating Philly. I could see them beating Philly. That always a choke out of them beat, unfortunately. A choke out of them beat. Uh-uh. It's, it's been a consistency in the past five seasons. I. I'm sorry, but if they play in the first round, if they play in the first round, and and, and B's gonna dominate, you uh, think so? <laughs> the playoff, yeah. When it comes to his playoff history, everything past the first round, he's cooked. It when it comes to uh, the semis, the second round, he's not good, and that's been shown historically uh, numerous times. But that first round, though, when he's completely he- healthy, he might miss a game. He might miss a game or two. But the rest of that series, he's going to be straight cooking, especially if the team has a height disadvantage or has bigs that can't match up to Embiid, which for the majority of the NBA, no, that's, 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 that's the same the problem that they yeah. have. Yeah. So um, I, I, no, I expect Philly to beat Indiana in a playoff series. I don't know. Match up with, uh, with each other. I think you'd be surprised. But another team is the Bucks for obvious reasons, with the Pacers winning the season series. Mm-hmm. That that could be interesting too, uh, yeah. with Milwaukee. Their biggest weakness uh, this season has been their uh, defending uh, on the wing. You look at their team right now. Who's the best wing defender? Jay Crowder. Yeah, uh, for real. That, was, that brother is um, not playing. I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of Jay Crowder. I, I'm. I don't think you're a big fan of Jake, uh, Jay Crowder nor Matt. Oh. I know for a fact that. 
our other guests that have been on this show, uh, like Danny, Tyler, they're not fans of Jay Crowder. <laughs> Jay Crowder, so I don't see him being uh, that key defender when it comes to the playoffs uh, yeah, in absolutely. April and May. So I just don't see that happening. So the Pacers and, and the Bucks, if they were to face off, I could possibly see uh, those teams going to a six, maybe even a seven game series. That's what Depending I'm saying. On Don't the be shocked if the firepower. surprise some people. Yeah, for sure. I mean, offensively, now with Siakam, they have another shot creator to match up against, well, to match up with Tyrese Halliburton, uh, as well as having the other supporting cast members like a Benedict, a Matherin, like a uh, Miles Turner, Buddy Hill still, still around, a great three-point shooter, other key guys as well. They still have the firepower and even added more with Siakam to compete with these top teams. Exactly. They only got better with the trade. Yeah. Now, do I think it's a huge increase? Not not, uh, not per se, like I no, said that, earlier. That's the, that's the general consensus with this trade. Uh, as but right I do think they got better. I want to make that very clear. I don't think it's like – I don't think it's like KD to the Suns, but – I do think no, not, not at all, not at all. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Shoot, right. hey, we'll see, we'll see. Uh, um, how this Pacers team gonna, you know, how they're gonna fit with Siakam on the team now. I, I'm not sure when their next game is. I, I gotta check on that, but shoot, I'm excited. Very It'll excited. Be an interesting next couple of months. The Pacers played. Uh, they should be tipping off right about now. Oh, the they're playing tonight. Yeah. Shoot. Pay attention to okay. that. I yeah, okay. I I gotta tune into that after this yeah. after we uh, after we finish recording. Absolutely. Um, shoot. Before before we go into our NFL segment for today, um, I also want to mention um quickly the the death of Warriors assistant assistant coach uh Dehan. I really do not want to mispronounce this man's name. Me. Me, Milo, uh, shoot, me, Milojevic, Milojevic, Dehan Milojevic. Um, yeah, it looks if you right. haven't known already. Apologies um, if it is pronounced incorrectly. Right, apologies to that. But if you haven't known already, uh, he passed away at 46 after suffering a heart attack during the Warriors team dinner. Um, very, very sad situation. You're talking about a guy that. His impact amongst the NBA, especially with the European players like Nikola Jokic, which he was his head coach during his time in in Europe, um, head coaching spot. His impact has been very seen. Uh, Luka Doncic, he wrote a little message on his shoes in during, well, in Utah, not Utah, in the Mavs' recent game they just played. That was a touching tribute. And I just want to give a, a quick uh, praise and condolences to the Warriors organization and with uh, his friends and family during this sad time. Yeah, Great. absolutely. And I'm just, I'll just echo what you said. I can't, couldn't have said it better myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, they postponed uh, Utah's, uh, the Warriors game versus the Jazz, obviously. And then the game Friday as well has been postponed. So two straight uh, postponed games. Who knows if what um, the next game they'll play doesn't really matter as we are there mourning the loss of their fellow friend and coach. So well, I just want to give a quick uh, statement about that. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah. Um. Shoot. Moving on to our next segment. Oh, we're about to say something on. No, no, I was not. Sorry. Okay. All good. All good. Moving on to our next segment, we are going to get in with the NFL Wild Card Weekend. Our reactions, real quick. What we're gonna do? We're gonna have three statements each, and we're just gonna spit out what what our thoughts are, what hot takes we got, and other good good stuff like that. So, um, only want to start first. What game are we starting with? Oh, no, you can go with, like, any statement you have, really. Oh, okay. Just three statements in total. I got you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Well, I'll start with CJ Stroud as him. I know I said earlier in the group chat, uh, 
when I was flaming you talking about Mahomes, I said CJ Stroud's going to be the best QB in the next coming years. But it's cool. Hey. Well, I'm not sure about best quarterback. I'm not sure. About well, best well, I may have been exaggerating a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's looking like a, a pretty good agenda so far, and I'm yeah. very intrigued to see what he does against this uh, stacked Ravens team. Mm, I will say borderline top five to seven, oh, eight for I'd sure. He's which he five. he's he's already in there right now. Top, who are your top five quarterbacks at the moment? Josh Allen, Mahomes. Okay. Two. Lamar. Three. Um, hold on. Hold on. Got I you, actually gotta think about this. Sure. Do, do you have do you have do you have Bert? You you got Purdy? You got Purdy? Oh, no, no, I said sure oh. as hell isn't Purdy. Oh, 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 you said sure. So I was about to say something. My my bad. My no, bad. no, no. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. No. So I'm I think no, we're like at that. we're at three right now. We're at three. Yeah, um, man. Are we, what, what about Joe Burrow? Aaron Rodgers? You you can, I guess. I think. I mean, I, I, a healthy Aaron Rodgers, I think it's got to be top five. Okay, I don't, Rodgers. I don't four. think it's. I don't think it's Joe Burrow. Oh, I don't think it's Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow, if he was well, a healthy, a completely healthy Joe Burrow, in my I opinion, Gasessis' so. opinion is top five quarterback in the league. But that that's your opinion. That I can't opinion. put him there. And I'll have CJ Stroud at five. Top five list. Oh, top CJ Stroud at five. Okay. So Mahomes, Josh Allen, yep. Lamar, Aaron Rodgers, and CJ Stroud. That's your five quarterbacks right now. I think so. That's why it seems five. the best to me. Interesting. That is interesting, right there, man. Ooh. But you, you got anything else to say about about Stroud's performance? What a player, man! First good Ohio State QB. You gotta love it. First good. Hey, shout shout out Kirk Herbstreit, man. Uh, <laughs> that that boy was nice. That boy was nice in college. Hey, that 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 man had sneaky athleticism and speed, man. Hey, Owen, if you or oh, Owen and to the rest of the audience watching. Look up Curb Herbst, Herb Street, Ohio State highlights. Hey, you you'll be him. shocked at how how good that man could run, man. I'll I'll just say that I will say that for sure. <laughs> All right, but but yeah, like a quick addition um, to what Owen said. Shoot, Stroud, he he has been having a phenomenal year. I I I think he's the offensive rookie of the year. I know people are gonna say Puka Nakua, but I feel like with what Stroud has done with this Houston offense and team in general, taking this team from an absolute dumpster fire a year prior and, and taking them to a playoff berth, uh, winning the division, the AFC South, and also winning a playoff game against the top three defense in the league, led by the potential depoy a winner in Miles Garrett. So salute to C.J. Stroud, what he's been doing with these weapons this whole entire year, especially without Take Dell, uh, their best receiver by far for a good chunk of the season. That is an outstanding feat for the young man. So salute to C.J. Stroud, one of the best QB seasons we've ever seen for a rookie quarterback in NFL history. Shoot, sky's the limit. Sky's the limit for sure. He's the man. Let's hear it. All right, let me go first. My first statement: You cannot win with Tua. Well said. You cannot win with Tua. And to start off, I'm going to give a quick rundown of Tua Tagovailoa and big games and his performances over the past few seasons, starting with 2020. I believe that was his rookie year. Yeah, that was his rookie year. Yep. Week 17 versus Buffalo, uh, they were they were a borderline playoff team, needed to get a win to at least stay alive in the playoff race against Buffalo, who the divisional rival, and what the two would do. He do do it. Yep. Had a very poor game. Uh, Dolphins got eliminated. Week 17 versus the Tennessee Titans, Again, the Dolphins, they were a winning football team, needed a win to stay alive in the playoff race. What did Tua do? 
went 18 for 38, had an interception, and the Dolphins lost that game, and they missed the playoffs. 2022, the Dolphins, Matt Daniel, his first year as the head coach, Tyree Kill, his first year from that Chiefs trade, the Dolphins offense, very exciting team to watch, explosive plays throughout, and they were having a, a great run to start off the season. Started eight and three, but in the next four games, 0 and four. In all those four games, he was very mediocre, uh, turning the ball over, even having very a, a large chunk of turnover worthy plays throughout those four games. They they went 0 and four, and despite <clears throat> making the playoffs, barely making the playoffs at nine and eight, they could have been so much better during during that that final stretch. I'm still not done. I'm still not done with keep this. Keep going, dude. Shoot, I'm going to keep cooking. Week 18 versus Buffalo. AFC East on the line. Sunday night football at home. Need this win to win the AFC East. And what does Tua do? Have a very mediocre game. And the final drive, he throws a game losing pick. And, and when you look back at the tape, you could clearly see him eyeballing, staring down Chase Claypool on that outbreaking route. That was the only man he saw. He, he I, I believe, in his mind, he, he, he thought that, yo, I'm throwing this to Claypool. I don't care if he's covered or open. I'm throwing it to Claypool. Obviously, Claypool was not open. Granted, Claypool went a horrible route. He, went, he ran a very horrible route. I'll, I'll give to us some great stare. But at the same time, threw a dangerous ball. Tear wrap picked it off, and the Buffalo Bills won that game. And finally, moving on to the wild card game against the Chiefs. Granted that the game was historically very cold. I believe that multiple fans got hypothermia after the game, which um, – Thoughts go up to them. Uh, I hope they weren't wearing uh, – well, I hope they were wearing clothes. I hope they weren't one of, one of those fans um, being completely, <laughs> like, shirtless during the game because that was really stupid. If you were one, one of those fans, then you're an idiot. I, I have nothing else to say about that. Well, but <laughs> let me continue. I understand the cold conditions, it being freezing cold. But as a franchise quarterback, as the main guy leading, leading this team, a playoff contending team, a Super Bowl contending team, you have to step up in these big moments. I don't care how much rain there is, snow there is. You got to come through. And for Tua Tagovailoa, he did not come through. And you could clearly see that with the play calling. Mike McDaniel, he did not trust this man to throw the ball downfield. Lots of short passes. Five, borderline five, five yards down down the field. Short, short developing routes. Except the deep ball to Tyreek Hill uh, on, on that touchdown play. If, if Tua was throwing the ball more than five yards, it was likely being incomplete. Although it was going overthrown, which it, was, it actually was overthrown. One of his passes, um, Jalen Wald was going on through the middle of the field. Uh, Tua had a clean pocket, threw it over Waddle's head, and the chief safety, Mike Edwards, picked it off, uh, turning the ball over. All Pretty much all of his plays uh, past five yards were incomplete. And the Dolphins that couldn't move the ball, the Chiefs uh, with Mahomes vastly outplayed him throughout the game. Can, can handle the cold pretty well, which a lot of QBs yeah. can do that. But that's what yeah. a franchise QB does. And Tua, he didn't, he didn't do that. He didn't pull through. And for the Dolphins right now, what, what their future holds for them, Tua is going to be on his fifth-year option. They already extended his fifth-year option, which – after the 2024 season's over, they're going to have a decision to make on whether or not they're going to resign him or not, To whether it's to match the current QB market right now, which for the for, for quarterbacks, it's like 40 to 50 mil uh, a year, like four or five years. Man. And for the Dolphins front office, their main question moving forward has to be, are we really confident in giving to it this much money over a long period of time when in moments like these big game moments, he has consistently fallen short and been outplayed by opposing quarterbacks. I just don't think they're going to do that. And they shouldn't. I couldn't agree more with you. 
Did you uh, speaking of like cold weather games? You see the stat that uh, Tua is winless in games below forty five degrees. Yeah, yeah, and 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 I'm not surprised at all because you look at Tua's game <clears throat> when he when he's out of structure, he's very poor at creating out out of structure. Um, when well, his biggest trait is his anticipation and accuracy throwing uh, with space. Uh, with with the the timing rounds Miami runs in their offense, but when you when you when the when you throw off the the Dolphins offense, when you throw them off of schedule, when you force Tua to make plays with his legs, he cannot do that. He cannot do that, especially in poor condition weather games. He's a structure quarterback. He's a game manager, not a game yep. changer. Yeah, for sure. And he's looked so good because who has he been throwing to? One of the best wide receivers in the league, if not the best. Yeah. So, there you go. Well yeah, said. Rob, uh, Robbie, like Robbie, say. Robbie Chosen, Robbie Chosen. Uh, he was mentioning Robbie Chosen. Uh, <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, for sure. Of uh, shout out him. Shout out to him. <clears throat> All right. Anyway, next next statement. Owen, your turn. Oof. Man, I'll, I'll take a, play, a page out of my boy's book, but the Eagles are frauds. Ben known it. Ben known it, Ben. Can't. They had. They were what? Ten and one. In the first. Yeah, they, they started you off ten and one. And man, did they go downhill from there? The proceeded to lose six of their next seven games. Unbelievable, for a oh. team that ten and one. That's I mean. Just looking at the stat sheet, that's looking like the best team in the league by far. Just to lose six out of the next seven, put up nine points in a playoff game. Come on now, you can't. Yeah, and, and, and right, and even it, with the ten and, and one record, right to start off the season, in those games, those wins, they weren't impressive. No, probably in any of them, they they were really. Floating by, which in the NFL, that's fine. I mean, wins are wins on the column, whether you like it or not. But at the same time, we saw the cracks opening up for this Eagles team. Um, and when throughout the year, as it unfolded, they just started to crack more and more. And with their damn, it eventually started to bust. And you look at the, the past few games on their um on under collapse both games against the Giants Tyra Taylor was cooking them the Cardinals game at home Kyler Murray in that Cardinals offense they they could do bro they were doing whatever they could against that Eagles defense um passing they were cooking their secondary especially uh, with routes outside the numbers and what we saw on Monday with Tampa Bay they, Baker Mayfield, when he, when the receivers weren't were uh, were not uh, dropping the ball, they they were cleanly catching it with their hands. They they were able to uh, to get <clears throat> to get big play out of big play every single time, and yeah. it's just it's just a boiling point of repeated errors and mistakes with this Eagles team, and with Monday it's just bursted. Yeah, for sure. And we're talking about a guy, uh, Jalen Hurts, that entering the season was viewed as one of the top quarterbacks in the league after coming off a Super Bowl appearance. But mm-hmm. I don't think we can say that or say that he's anywhere near that anymore. Which No, I no, mean, we, we can't say that anymore. No, we, yeah, we sure can't. For sure. Um, I mean, and they're going to go same game. Man, shout out Baker Mayfield, dude. What a player. Yeah, yeah shout, out, shout out Baker, man. Uh, he's He's had a very solid season. So and and, and salute to Dave Canales, uh, their offensive coordinator too, uh, with, with Tampa Bay. He has been phenomenal developing Baker uh, throughout this year, being able to um, g- give him these great schemes for him to play on a weekly basis and unlocking uh, him with the rappers they already had with uh, Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, and with the run game with uh, with Sean White, uh, making this Bucks offense respectable unit. So salute. Yes. Yeah, that, that is my take. The Eagles have been frauds. We've known it. It's been shown. Yeah. Um, 
ironically, with my next seg- segment, I'm going to mention Philly as well. And <laughs> for Philly, they need a hard reset. Shoot, I, I don't know where to start. I really don't know where to start, man. There, there are so many issues with this Philly team. I'm, I'm going to start with the offense. Like, Monday, schematically, that was horrible. Uh, Tampa Bay, Todd Bowles with that defensive unit. They were able to blitz the Hurts in the Eagles O-line all day, especially when they came out in, in five, five out sets. And for the Eagles offense, you looked at you look at the tape. There were no developing plays in the middle of the field, no slants other than that big huge uh play Devonta Smith had to bring him into near red zone range, which shout out Devonta Smith. Yeah, he had a very good game uh, on Monday. But other than that, there were very little plays where it involved developing um short the short routes in the middle of the field, whether it was crossing routes, uh drag routes, or slants. And for Dylan Hurts, I get that it's very easy to put all of the blame on him since he's the quarterback, which to, to an extent I do understand because his his game has fallen off compared to last year. There has been a clear decline in his game. You got to look at Nick Sirianni and Brian Johnson with this offensive unit. And this offensive unit throughout the entire year has been pitiful. And I don't know, I don't know for next year. I know that this story came out that Howie Roseman, um, their GM, they're looking into getting top-tier assistance to help out Sirianni next year. But at the same time, how how does that what, what does that make of Sirianni as a head coach? Yeah, you need with, to with, with be carried his, by assistant coaches? Come on now. Right, with his scheme – with his offensive scheme, which it's his scheme. It's his scheme. Uh, the scheme they were running the whole year is Nick Sirianni's scheme, and it was the scheme when he first started as the head coach back in 2021. And in 2021, if you didn't remember, or if you don't remember, they, they were a poor offensive unit to start the season off. But midseason, they made the change to give <clears throat> the play calling to then OC Shane Steichen. And, and they completely became a better unit overnight. And next year, St. Stagg was still the play caller offensively. The Eagles win the Super Bowl. They were a top offensive unit. Hurts had an MVP caliber year. The rank game was great. And they nearly won the Super Bowl. And you take away Stagg in and leave it to Sirianni, an inexperienced uh, coordinator in Brian Johnson. It just makes for a very poor unit. Very poor unit. Yeah, it's pretty crazy, man. Yeah, and I want I want to mention the defense as well. I Matt Patricia, I I never understood the 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 decision to move from Sean Desai to Matt Patricia so late into the year, it, and and it showed on Monday that that big play, uh, Trey Palmer had that touchdown run. Bradbury completely missing the tackle, which, by the way, he, he's been absolutely atrocious the whole year. Debo Samuel was right about that, man. He is not <laughs> he He might be out, out of the league within the next year. Who knows? But, but, but let me continue. The defensive effort they showed, missing tackles, not, not, not <clears throat> getting exposed in, in the run game, toothless, the passing game, Big chunk plays being allowed. It's just a sign of coaching. It's just a sign of these guys not being prepared. Even with the veterans they have, it's just a sign of poor leadership. It's a, it's a sign of poor scheming. And it's a sign of poor mismanagement from this unit. Exactly. There's just systemic issues that led to their downfall. Yeah. Uh, and... I want to say the last thing before we move on. I know that the the Eagles players, they've expressed um, Sirianni to be back next year. Fletcher Cox said it. Jalen Hurts has said it in the media. But in my eyes, you you can't bring that man back. You can't bring that man back for how he's messed up uh, this entire team with his poor play calling, schematic uh, style of play over the season with him bringing two inexperienced 
uh, assistance as offensive and defensive coordinator following the departures of Jonathan Gannon and Shane Steichen. All of those factors, I, I just don't see him being a good coach for this team uh, heading into next year and, and beyond. I just don't see it. And I was a Nick Sirianni guy, too. Yeah. I was a Nick Sirianni guy, too. I, I thought – I thought he was a big one of the biggest reasons why they were so successful in seasons past, but I guess not. I guess not. He not tricked anymore. us all. He tricked us all, man. He fooled us. He, he fooled sure us. did. Man. Pretty crazy. We've been duped. We we were duped, bamboozled, hoodwink, hoodwink, led astray. Yep. Yep. All sad, right. Sad, sad things, man. Sad things. All right, Owen. Uh, next one for you. Last one. Man, aside from the Ravens and the uh, uh, the Forty ers the Bills are looking like the best team. That, that that's my take. Granted, okay, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you explain. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you explain. I'll say I'll say with their, with an asterisk. Granted, they played the Steelers, not exactly a Super Bowl contending team, but man, Josh Allen, he just comes to the playoffs, he turns into a different person. It's unbelievable. He's done it time and time again. And it's seriously fun to watch. Makes the Bills just a hell of a team. I want to hear your thoughts on it, though. No. I, I, no? I don't think, I don't think the Bills are the third best team right now in the playoffs. I would put Detroit, even Kansas City above them right now um, when it comes to but both their, their balance – you compare the two teams uh, with Buffalo. I just think they have more balance uh, when it when, like f- from a team standpoint, time wise, and, and with better coaching as well. Um, heading into this playoff scenario uh, with this divisional round weekend, I just think that Dan Campbell, Andy Reid, I, I just feel like they do their part way better than what um, Sean McDermott has done. With this unit, although the this Buffalo team is very hot, they've been winning a lot offensively. The run game has been turning on with James Cook being more involved. Josh Allen is still there. I just don't see this team, especially with the amount of injuries they have defensively. I just don't see this team being the third best team in the NFL right now. I don't. Man, interesting take though. Mm-hmm. And I. That's tough because I do think that running game is there now, where it wasn't earlier in the season. Mm-hmm. And right, I, so I shout out Joe Brady, shout out Joe Brady, new coordinator, uh, offensive know, coordinator for for this unit. And I also want to say, Diggs, he hasn't been playing great. He hasn't been playing to Stephon Diggs's caliber as he normally would be. And I will say, I just don't think you can expect that to go on much longer. I, I would imagine in his next game he'll be back above that hundred yard receiving mark. Nah, he's going up against Sneed Island, uh, Legere Sneed. That's not <laughs> happening. It's um, gonna happen. Should should have made All Pro, first team All Pro. Should have made the Pro Bowl team. But, but he, we move, you know. You uh, better than Sertan easily. Um, he can go band for band with Sertan. Um, he can go he can go band for band with any corner in the league. I believe that. Ooh, okay. Easily. Come on, he's in the league. Set it with his chest. Sneed Island, baby. Let's go. Come on. That's my guy, man. And Trevor Duffy, too. We we got, bro, like I said last episode, too, we got dogs in that secondary. Don't play with us. Let's go. All right. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. All, all right. Um, My last segment, the Dallas Cowboys are never making a deep run with Mike McCarthy. Well said. And, and with with this statement, I, I wrote this before the news that they're going to retain McCarthy for the 2024 season. And now hearing that news, I'm trying to figure out the reasons why they want to keep him. And I, I've come up with these two things. Dak, he had his best year uh, in the post, Kellen Moore era and in Dallas obviously Kellen Moore he went to take the the Chargers job at OC leaving his post so you got that right there 
And for this Cowboys team, with how they're currently structured, they're still a top two to three team in the, in the NFC. So I feel like they would still want to keep a more experienced head coach, um, you know, compared to bringing in a new guy who doesn't know these players and, well, preferably a younger coach, uh, giving the keys to a younger coach who hasn't really managed the team as talented with as many playoff aspirations like a Dallas Cowboys to start off his coaching career, head coaching career. Yeah, but other think, than that, uh, oh, you was gonna say one. Yeah, I was just thinking. Say, um, the reason they keep they're holding on to Mike McCarthy is that Jerry Jones is stubborn. Mm. Uh, that that I'm could thinking. be that could be a reason too. That could be another reason. I mean, Jason Garrett, he should have been fired so many years before. Jerry gave that man too much leeway during his time in da- Dallas. And yeah. for how for how much talent Jason Gary had, offense and defense, Tony Romo, um, Demarco Murray, Jason Witten, Des Bryant, Tyrone Smith, uh, Travis Frederick, Zach Martin, Sean Lee, Demarcus Ware, so many names, and Gary com- consistently un- underperformed, season after season, playoff run after playoff run, disappointment after disappointment. And currently right now, we're, we're seeing the same thing with Mike McCarthy at the home. The same thing. A whole lot the of nothing happening. The exact same thing. And what we saw that Sunday versus the, the Green Bay Packers on their home turf against a seventh seed. Now, I understand that the Packers are very hot right now. That offense has been humming. Aaron Jones has been balling out. Jordan Love has been a franchise quarterback. Uh, the, the, for the final stretch of the season. But at the same time, to get your asses kicked like that, to get completely outmatched offensively, and especially defensively, I'm going to cook Dan Quinn for a minute, to get your <laughs> asses kicked every single snap by that package run game. Aaron Jones just felt like he had 10-plus yards on every single carry when he touched the ball. This man, Dan Quinn, was going in dime packages bringing in five, even six DBs out on the field when the Packers is going in 12 personnel with two tight end sets, with them being a mainly run-first run team, run-first offense. And they were getting cooked, and that man, Dan Quinn, couldn't, couldn't adjust. He was the, a big reason why they lost that game, why they got their asses blown out like that. And McCarthy, too, for having this team so unprepared and having this team so mismanaged against a team that they should have beat in Jerry World, and at home. Yeah. Cowboys. It, it, it's 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 it, unfortunate. It, it, it's unfortunate. It's never their year, man. And we've all. No, it's understood. never their year. And, and I was trolling. And I was trolling when I said that the, the, the <laughs> Dallas Cowboys will never make another deep run because they're, they're the Cowboys. I don't want to have that type of analysis, uh, that basic analysis, you know, because I feel like it's too easy. To have the Cowboys being a punching bag, it, it's it's really easy right now. I mean, yeah, man. It, but it, it's like, like, like as it's easy as it money. is, as easy as it is, they just they haven't given us any reason to not make them a punching bag. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. Like I was right. Yeah. I was right with, with this McCarthy team, with this poor game management in late games, and with them not being prepared when it comes to uh, the playoffs and that them matching physicality with other physical teams like a San Fran, like a Green Bay as well, and getting their asses beat on both sides of the ball. Like, it's yeah, it's not good. It's not a good look. It doesn't. It's not a good look. But it's funny. <laughs> it, it was funny. I was laughing my ass off uh, watching that game, especially when Dak threw that pick six. Um, I, that Dak – he he was poor that game. I don't care about the numbers. You could throw the numbers at me. He was very poor. And that pick yeah. six was the pinnacle of that. So I, I was laughing my ass off really hard. Right <laughs> I'll say that. Yeah. It was a movie in the group chat too. Oh, oh, oh it was yeah, yeah. as well. It was a movie. <laughs> well, we were just baking. We were just baking the hell out of Dallas the whole game. So that that was a good moment. Once That's again, a good moment every a year. Punching day. <laughs> It makes for great com- uh, comedic jokes and uh, great content, which for all the media platforms, okay, I can see why, you know, they, they do that every January, which 
Uh, for Dallas, they make that very easy for themselves to, to be made fun of. So, <laughs> hey. It's funny. That's all I can say. It's funny. Super, super, super duper funny. Like it's 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 all it's peak entertainment. It it's really peak is. Entertainment. Uh, <laughs> Let's hope the Cowboys never change, man. <laughs> no, I, I don't think they will, especially with them keeping the card beat. So, right, we're gonna have a lot a lot of jokes to be thrown uh, in the near future. <laughs> yes, hey. All right. All right uh, so you want to get into? Yeah, we, yeah, we gotta get into predictions. We gotta get into predictions. Um, let's start off with the NFC. Um, Green Bay versus San Fran. Man, I think the Jordan Love run, as good as he's been, is done. Toast. I don't think Green Bay is gonna hold anything to the Niners, man. Jordan loves my guy too, man. I, I know. I, it's I love that watching that kid play, man. Bro, he 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 was phenomenal against the Cowboys. He was he absolutely off platform throws, baking the, the Cowboys when they blitzed. He was unfazed. It, it was a beautiful sight to see. And with this Packers team right now, whether they win this game or not, the future is very bright with Jordan Love being at the helm, man the floor, proving himself as a reliable play caller and game manager. Post the Rodgers era, and with these weapons too, they don't got a main one option, but they got a lot of dependable weapons outside and, and at tight end. Whether it's Romeo Dobbs, um, Dontavion Wicks, Jalen Reed, even Christian Watson when he's healthy, as well as Luke Mutsgrave and Tucker Craft, they got a lot of dependable guys that can make plays when needed to. Yeah, absolutely. It it's amazing. Whether win or lose for cow or not cowboys, sorry, pardon me. Packers fans. You should walk away or you shouldn't walk away upset. You may not if they lose, you may not walk away happy, but you shouldn't walk away upset knowing what's to come. hmm Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, with my prediction, I'm gonna agree with you, Owen. I have the Niners beating them, I think quite handedly. Yeah. I feel like it's gonna be a Niners win by two plus scores. I just feel like mainly with the Niners run game with McCaffrey and their O line led by Trent Williams, they're they're gonna dom- dominate that that uh, Packer defense throughout the whole game. The Packers they're very mediocre against the run statistically. They most of their stats they're on on the bottom half of that end. So I feel like with the with the Niners if they can establish the run early and often while allowing these deep shot plays to develop with guys like Debo Samuel, IU Kittle, their playmakers, they've been hanging on with them throughout this entire year. It, it's gonna be it's gonna be life for them. It's gonna be very life for them, especially at home too. Yeah, man, and say what you want about Brock Purdy. I don't feel like in this game it's gonna matter. They just have too much firepower. Just outclassing the not or the the Packers, sorry. Yeah, bro, this man, bro, this man, oh, oh, I just got a, a chat from Matt, man. He said he want he wants to to send me to send him the invite. You got a late join for, with about like 15 minutes left in the pod. Should I put him on the phone? Yeah, fuck it, dude. I feel like we're mad ahead of schedule right now. This is we're on less than an hour, bro. It's been light today. Well, yeah, we, there hasn't been a whole lot other than Siakam trade, really, and playoff predictions. No, I, I'm I'm about to put Matt on the phone. <laughs> oh, he's typing right now. He's typing right now. <laughs> oh, he, okay. He said, "Fuck, all good, understandable." Damn, <laughs> bro, I thought well, he was gonna gonna be all like out all night, man. That's crazy. For real, shoot. What a good oh, and, and and to the fans. Uh, he says he apologizes and he's sorry for the, uh, you know, for for the issue, the absence the issue right now. So, hey man, he's gonna be back next week for sure though. So, hey, we can't wait for that. We cannot. Hey, I'll wait. be there. Yeah, I'll be there as well. Anyway, you want to move on to the next game? Uh, yeah, next game. Let me get back on track. Texans versus Ravens in Baltimore. And it's like. The same situation. It's like Groundhog Day, man. It's like love CJ Stroud. Like I said, 
use him. But it doesn't matter. Baltimore's too good. Literally the same situation as the previous game we discussed. Mm. I'm going to say the Ravens. Yeah. I'm going to say Baltimore. Although C.J. Stroud, he's a beast, elite quarterback already in his rookie year. And last week against Cleveland, a top three defense, he he cooked the shit out of them, man. He he baked them um, in the blitz. It didn't matter. Being able, uh, that throw to Nico Collins, multiple throws to Nico Collins, actually phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. The perfect velocity, great great mechanics. The whole the whole package for the current modern day quarterback. The explosiveness, it, it was insane to watch, and it was it was very enjoyable to watch in real time. But with this Baltimore defense, I when you compare Baltimore to Cleveland, Baltimore is more sound defensively. They're not as well while while they are aggressive as Cleveland, they're more sound as a unit. They don't really bite off screens. Those misdirection plays, uh, Mike McDonald, he really has those guys fully in tuned against opposing offenses, and I feel like that's really going to be the difference for this game. The the defense getting to Stroud early and often, make, forcing them to go behind the sticks, getting the right game completely out of sync, the Texas right game led by Devin Singletary, and making Stroud become very uncomfortable in the pocket, which that is very hard to do. But, again, this Ravens defense is elite. They're the best defense in the league, and they're the team to do it. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with Baltimore. Yep. Again, I'll say it once for the previous game. Say it again. They're just going to outclass them. Too much yeah. firepower. I'm, I'm, I'm really – I wonder how the Texans, their defense will match up against this Ravens offense. That'll be interesting to see, especially the secondary with the led by Stingley as well. I want, I want to see how how that can happen because their their wideouts OBJ and Say Flyers they're both very explosive, can can get off big players too in the passing game. So we'll see how that happens. Yeah, for sure. All right, what's what are we at with the next one? <clears throat> Excuse me. Next game, Bucks versus Lions in Detroit. This is gonna be an interesting one, man. This this is gonna be one of the banger games, I will say. Um, I got Detroit winning this, and it's gonna be or I'm gonna be honest, I think it's just because they're gonna be playing in Detroit. First real playoff game, it's not the wild card anymore. It's getting serious. Those fans are gonna be phenomenal. We know uh we know Detroit's fired up. I mean, did you see that locker room uh, video? Well, that 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 was a beautiful sight to see, that was especially the ending. Beautiful, hey, man. So salute to Detroit. Salute to it. Lions fans. The whole organization. They they deserve this one. The curse. Well, not not the curse. The streak is finally over. First playoff game since '91. And you look, <laughs> you watch the ending of that game. The absolute chills you got. Watching the, the crowd celebrate, you had fans crying in the stands. That moment was beautiful to see. And as a team, as a fan of a team who who is on that trajectory, um, many years before, in 2015, we beat the Houston Texans 30 to zero uh, in the wild card game. We um, during that time, that was our first playoff win since '93, and. Sixth grade year old me was absolutely ecstatic. You couldn't tell me anything, man. That was like one of the happiest days of my life at the time. I was so ecstatic experiencing that moment and having to experience that with my dad uh, as Chiefs fans. So for Detroit fans, I'm I'm very happy for y'all. It's a great feeling and cherish the, uh, that moment, man. Cherish that moment forever. Yeah, man. Something more my speed, man. It reminded me of the Kings playing in the playoffs for the first time in 17 years. Mm-hmm. Gave me that same feeling. Chills, like you for said. Sure, man. Well, it, it's always a great feeling to see teams that historically have been a laughing stock, you know, blossom and bloom into being like a respectable franchise. I, I love seeing that in sports. It's one of my favorite sports uh, stories, whether it's 
basketball, football, like soccer, baseball, like, you know, everything. We love to see the underdog win. We love to see the underdog win sometimes, man. We love it. That's great, man. God, I love it. But uh, speaking on on the actual game this week, uh, Bucks first Lions, I'm picking Detroit again. Yeah. Um, Jameer Gibbs during their uh, appearance uh, against the Bucks in Tampa Bay earlier this season when they beat them 20 to 6. He wasn't playing. David Montgomery was out for the majority of the game, which Dave Reynolds was uh, playing most of the snaps as a relief role at running back. I feel like with those two guys, Gibbs and Montgomery, being fully healthy again with their dominant run game, with their dominant O-line, I feel like they're going to really have a have a fingerprint, have their fingerprints implanted uh, in this one as well. Uh, if they can get big chunk plays early and – Get the get the passing game going with uh, explosive plays with guys like J Mo, which he had a touchdown in that game I mentioned earlier. Uh, Josh and Reynolds, and especially with the Monterey St. Brown, uh, getting those uh, huge chain chain plays, chain chunk yards uh, in the passing game as well. I, I feel like Detroit uh, they're gonna win this one probably uh, by two scores or more. Yeah. Also, uh, kind of off topic, but kind of on topic. Do you see Amon Ross St. Brown dyed his hair blue? I love it. Hey, be, taking be a page out of the Marcus Smart with the team, book. man. Let's exactly. go. Let's go. I love it, I, I, I love it man. Uh, so he's a, he's a great leader within that team. Uh, doing that, you know, so is just passing for for this franchise. Which you look at Detroit, man. Dan Campbell has these guys locked in consistently. So. What a coach, man. Mm -hmm. Love me some Dan Campbell. All right. Final game, Bills versus Chiefs. I think this will be the the second round game of the division. I believe so, too. And before we give our thoughts, Matt just sent me a text. He said, and I quote, let me get this off my phone. Tell them. Bills my lock for this week. So he is locking Buffalo hey. in to beat Kansas City at Orchard Park this week. We heard it from good, Mr. Kishinevsky good timing, first. Matt. Good timing. On cue. All right. All All right. On your thoughts? <sighs> I don't know. This is seriously could go either way. We know the Bills and the Chiefs have had a history in the playoffs. The Chiefs winning. I believe every mm-hmm. time, but the it being first all, Allen in the postseason, great TV, great TV. exactly. Um, but man, this is the first time it's going to be in Buffalo. Oh, that being said, I'm going to stick with history because history repeats itself. I think the Chiefs are going to win. Good man, good. And man. Not that not brothers. that doesn't mean I want them to win, but do uh, I think okay, they win? I, yeah. I completely understand that, you know, rival fans. So I get it. But hey, I'm going to take what I can get from this. I'll take what I can get. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm going to go with KC on this one. A little bit of a biased take, but, you know, <laughs> man, we, we uh, move. completely move. unbiased. Um, Mahomes, Mahomes' first game, playoff game on the road. Am I worried about his performance in this game? No. This is the greatest playoff performer in NFL history for a quarterback. We know what Mahomes can do in these situations. When when the <laughs> when everything stacked up against him and this KC team, he comes through at the in the end. Come on now, it's it's 15 in January. Well, what do you expect? It's cash money every time. We're gonna have Pacheco back for this one, which in in our regular season matchup he wasn't there. Uh, he was nursing a shoulder injury. We're gonna have Drew Tranquil back as well. Arguably been our best linebacker in that unit for the whole season. He's a big uh, guy in our defense when it comes to both the passing and run game, defending those those two aspects, and also with uh, the Bills defense. I forgot to mention. So many injuries stacked up with this team right now. Uh, I'm going to give a quick rundown of the names that had injuries, suffered injuries during that game against Pittsburgh. Christian Benford, 
star linebacker for that unit has stepped up with the with the absence of Matt Milano too as well. Oh, Christian Benford. Oh, oh no, not Christian Benford. I mix it up with Terrell Bernard. I was mentioning that for Terrell Bernard. Christian Benford at corner, he ste- stepped up there. Uh, Terrell Bernard, I was mentioning earlier, star linebacker. Taron Johnson, one of the best nickel cornerbacks in the entire league. And Braylon Spector, who has stepped up uh, at the linebacking position as well this season. So all four guys on this unit could possibly not play. Or if they do play, they're going to be banked up at least. And for, for this team right now with KC, I feel like with the run game right now, with Pacheco being healthy again and Clyde stepping in, they're going to get some some run plays off. They're going to get big big runs in the run game. The the combination of well Pacheco in the run game along with uh, Kelsey and Rasheed Rice, my boy, in the passing game. That's all we're going to need for this. If they can get huge plays with Mahomes throwing them the ball, it's going to be solid for us. While I do expect this to be a classic, it's going to be a close game, which is expected with these two teams matching up in this time of the year. We're going to pull it off on their home field. And going to the AFC Championship game again, a.k.a. the Arrowhead Invitational, so I can't, <laughs> I can't the that. Invitational. That's funny. It is the Arrowhead Invitational, man. Deal with it. That's Let's funny. go. All right. Well, yeah, there's the predictions. You heard can't wait first. to do it for a sixth straight time, man. It's going to be beautiful <laughs> scenes. I can't wait for it. Bring on Baltimore if we do play them in, in, in the title game. Let's go. That man. happens. Y'all getting cooked. Sorry. We might we might get cooked, but you know I got faith in my guys. Seven anyway. straight uh, appearance in the title game, I believe it was six or seven, but I'm sure it was seven. I'm sure it's seven. If we do make it, which we will make it, get your popcorn right. ready. I believe that. All right. Well, got anything else to say? Nah, that's pretty much it. Well, shorter episode, but like we said, not not as much to talk about, not as much to cover. Not as much happening. In, bro, an hour and seven. Oh, I'm seeing on the screen right now. We went by quick. Good time. That was a quick hour, very though. I would say. Yeah. Very good time. Oh, yeah. Always is. Hey, it's, yeah, man. It's good for me because I got mad stuff to do for tomorrow. I got to go to the doctor's appointment in the morning. So, not excited that about that, well. but every move. Um, But, yeah, with that being said, if you guys are still here, um, thank you so much for taking your time off to watch this video. Um, follow us on all of our social media platforms, IG, TikTok, and YouTube, all with the handle at Lunch from the Bates. We post there daily on a daily basis, bringing you lots of great content from our episodes and as well as uh, highlights from the sports world. So uh, <clears throat> if you were to follow and subscribe, it would be a great treat for you all. So, okay. Yep, couldn't agree more. All right, all right. Let's follow. Send these. We gonna send our ladies and gentlemen off on a high note, and we are going to say peace. We're gonna go watch the Pacers game. <laughs> sure do. That game still on. It started at eight, dude. Oh, uh, okay. Then okay. Then still on. All right. Yep. <laughs> we gotta go, man. Later. Peace out, man.